Uh, hello, everybody. Oh. Welcome to uh, another session of West Talks. Uh, last year, we did not have the West Talk session because uh, of the beginning of semester. Uh, but thank you for joining us back again this week. Um, and I'm excited to be introducing um, a very interesting speaker today. So just to give a brief background, uh, the West Talk series is in collaboration with IC Impacts and UBC uh, Future Waters Group. Uh, the IC Impacts is basically the Canada India Research Center of Excellence, um, and it serves as a new model for international collaboration between India and Canada. And uh, the, their aim is co developing research solutions to solve global challenges. Um, and it, it was established in 2013. And we also have the UBC Future Waters Group or the UBC Water Cluster, which was recently formed uh, as a UBC Research Excellence Cluster for um, studying the future states of water. And it focuses on interdisciplinary research uh, across water uh, research at the intersection of law, policy, governance, engineering, and applied and biophysical sciences. Uh, the current West Talks organizing committee, uh, I think there's an outdated slide, sorry, Farias uh, name should also be on there. Um, but uh, currently it's uh, five of us, which is uh, myself, uh, Jaskaran, who is the past chair of the IC Impact Student Committee, and he is currently a postdoctorate fellow at uh, McGill University. We have Fuhar, who is the current co-chair of the IC Impact Student uh, Engagement Committee, um, and also Carl Zimmerman, um, who is currently the co, co I shouldn't say co-founder, but um, member of the starting uh, organization for the UBC Future Voice Group, as well as the chair for the West Conference next year. And also we have Feria, who is in charge of uh, communications and uh, represents the IC Impacts Committee. We've actually had a great list of speakers so far. We started off with Dr. Christoph Lucy back uh, in the end of June. And, oh, sorry about that. Um, and today uh, we have Dr. Elizabeth Tilly uh, from uh, AWAG and University of Malawi. She's mainly based in the University of Malawi. Um, and today she's gonna to be talking about uh, trash and its role in sanitation and resource recovery. So just to give a brief background uh, about Dr. Tilly, um, she's uh, currently a senior lecturer in the Department of Environmental Health at the University of Malawi, um, uh, the Polytechnic in Blantyre, is, is that the right pronunciation? Blantyre, Malawi? Okay, uh, and then also an uh, adjunct professor at the University of Victoria. Uh, she's an engineer and an economist and interested in technological, social and financial drivers for sustainable urban services, uh, especially in low income settings. Uh, she actually got an MASc from the University of British Columbia uh, with Dr. Mavenik uh, and Dr. Jim Atwater. So if you've been around at UBC for a while, you'll know those names. And she then went on to do her PhD um, from AWAG um, with a background in both environmental engineering and development economics. She uses a variety of methods to identify and test acceptable, affordable, sustainable options for improving sanitation infrastructure, uh, use and maintenance. Uh, her uh, experiences in several countries, such as Canada, Switzerland, Mexico, um, Nepal, South Africa, and many more uh, listed in this uh, um, slide here. And I'll hand it over to her um, so that she can talk more about her experience. Great. I'm going to stop sharing so that you can share your screen. Okay. Thanks so much for that. Unfortunately, I've never, I've only been to India once for about <laughs> four days. So I know very little about that, but it's definitely on my bucket list. Oh, uh, it says disa you disabled screen sharing. Share screen. No, it won't let me share my screen. Faria, maybe you need to give her access to share screen. Oh, I'm co-host now, okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. Cool. There we go. And let's do this. Okay. Can everyone see that? Yep. Good. Yes. Cool. Yeah. Yep. Good. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is great. Thank you. I'm we 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 didn't have things like this when I was at UBC. Um so it's cool. I wish I could have learned more about what, uh, what happens when you graduate. Um, so I'm going to talk about trash and sanitation. I think trash is really an emerging issue in sanitation, and it's not really something that's been taken uh, very seriously um, to date. 
So this is a picture of me um, in my first job. I went to Waterloo. Boo. And um, after I did my undergrad there, I worked for CETA uh, in Mexico, where I worked on a sanitation project. And this was really the first exposure I had to sanitation um, technologies in low income countries. And it really sort of um, developed my interest in urine and specifically nutrient recovery possibilities from urine. Um, in that project that I was working on, we, we built urine diverting toilets, which I'll come back to. And, and we're trying to harvest the urine. Um, urine's really rich in nitrogen, phosphorus, obviously water. Um, so it's a, it's a really great liquid fertilizer, but it's very, very difficult to move around. It's heavy. It doesn't smell great. You don't really know how much you're applying. Uh, there's the potential for salinity buildup over time. Um, so this was coincidentally the same time that, like you mentioned, Abhishek, uh, that Dr. Mavenik was building up his Struvite group. Um, at UBC. So actually it was what motivated me to go to UBC and do my master's in struvite production. And so struvite, if you haven't been uh, indoctrinated, I'm not sure how much of a, a, a legacy there is still there, but struvite is uh, magnesium ammonium phosphate hexahydrate. And it's a very um, clean, easy to precipitate, phosphorus mineral that is a great slow release fertilizer. And, and one of the reasons that we are interested in nutrient recovery and phosphorus specifically is because there are some predictions that, that we're facing a phosphorus crisis. Um, there's, there's various geopolitical factors involved and, and use, but the, the kind of key message is that Phosphorus doesn't have a natural cycle in the environment the same way that nitrogen does. Um, so once we mine it, it's something we mine and we use it um, in agriculture, it goes into plants, we consume it, we excrete it, and, and most of that phosphorus can never be recovered in, a, in an easy or financially sustainable uh, form. So, so the idea of recovering nutrients from urine um, in, in sort of the form of struvite is quite easy. Um, you can see on the left a urine diverting dry toilet. So basically you sit down, the urine goes in the front, the feces fall in the back, and then the photo on the right just shows a simple schematic of how the urine could either be collected in a container or it could be infiltrated into a collection system. And, and ultimately, that urine could be um, sort of harvested at a large scale. This is uh, a photo from uh, South Africa where I spent a couple years, and this was a large scale urine collection program with the Itaquini municipality, which is um, the municipality um, that contains Durban. So in this project, we collected, um, well, each one of these containers is a thousand, a thousand liters. Um, I think maybe more, 2,000 liters. Um, so we were collecting large volumes of urine, we were pumping it, transferring it, processing it into struvite, um, using not exactly the Ostara technology, but of course this is the technology that was um, developed at UBC and ultimately patented um, coming out of the, the research group of, of Don Mavenik. Um, the Ostar technology is very, very high tech, um, requires a fair amount of energy, but in, in rural uh, Itaquini in South Africa, it's, it was quite easy to, to produce um, a simple version of this that could be used. This is the, the crystal green product that was produced, that is produced by the Ostara reactor. Ours did not look as good, but you know, it got the job done. So, the, the kind of take home message with this little background introduction is just that there has been a long and consistent focus on phosphorus recovery from urine 
or from, in the case of um, the OSTAR technology, from, from uh, digester supernatant. So really um, high strength liquid feedstocks that have quite high levels of phosphorus. Um, we excrete um, most of the phosphorus from our bodies in the form of urine. So recovering it from urine is quite easy. Recovering phosphorus from digester supernatant, again, quite a pure, um, rich feedstock. And, and this is all sort of setting up the, the, the difference between recovering nutrients from urine, which is heavy and difficult to transport, but is also quite pure in a way um, because there, there's not a lot of other stuff in it, apart from salt and maybe some pollution. But realistically, the, um, the process and the technology of recovering phosphorus from these liquid streams has been, has been quite well studied, implemented at large scale, and, and we've kind of, kind of mastered it, if you will. On the other hand, <laughs> um, in, in much of the world, uh, and, and in the global south, low-income countries, we don't have either access to these very clean liquid feedstocks, um, or if we do, like in the Durban example, they're quite difficult to transport. And obviously from a sanitation perspective, providing sanitation and actually ensuring that there are toilet facilities and that they're safe and hygienic is, is the main problem. So this is a photo from Kibera. The, in the foreground is Kibera, one of the world's largest um, informal settlements. You can see sort of the fancier parts of Nairobi in the background. And, and Nairobi, um, or sorry, Kibera obviously is just, it's very typical of a very high density, low income informal settlement where sanitation is, is very lacking. So the question for people working in sanitation is, is not only how do we provide good sanitation, but how can we potentially um, harvest some of the nutrients uh, that we've learned to harvest from either um, high-tech um, wastewater treatment plants like in Anastas Island or uh, using other methods, but in, in applying them to these low-income settings. So, as a small background, I'm sure this isn't new to you, but um, cities without sewers are, are, are the rule, not the exception. Uh, more than 90% of cities in the developing world do not have sewers and so rely on on-site sanitation. Um, we're expecting um, a large migration. We've already seen it happening in most cities around the world. A lot of rural to urban migration, increasing not only the numbers of people, but the numbers um, of people without sanitation and increasing the density, which is another really difficult variable to work with. Um, like you saw in the photo of Nairobi, it's cities are very heterogeneous. You have pockets of very high density, very low density, different elevations. Um, at this point, in sort of the human, sorry, mosquito, um, human trajectory, uh, it, it, it's not possible to replan cities, right? We're stuck with what we have and, and it's complicated and it's messy. Um, in a lot of countries that have water, um, septic tanks and, and water-based sanitation is possible. Um, if you think about um, countries like Vietnam, for example, uh, parts of Indonesia, there's, where there's a lot of water, water-based sanitation is possible and, and we have those technologies to work with. The bigger challenge is in cities without water. Um, so most of, most of Sub-Saharan Africa, um, in these situations, these contexts, we would focus primarily on pit latrines, 
which or, or different underground technologies, which are really just designed to contain and store excreta and keep it away from humans. And that's really the goal of, of sanitation is to prevent contact between um, people, animals, and, and excreta and just break the potential um, transmission routes. Um, again, I mean, just a simple schematic of a pit latrine. They come in all different shapes and sizes. And, and for rural situations and, and for, let's say, the, the first 30 of the last 50 years, um, it wasn't a bad idea, right? It, it was low cost. It allowed people to have a sanitation technology on site. There was a big focus on reducing open defecation. Um, you could design and implement in, in many different ways. But as I mentioned, um, with increasing city sizes, with increasing density, um, with increasing pressure on existing uh, land, um, even this technology has become somewhat unsustainable especially because traditionally um, pit latrines would be used and then filled and then another one dug. And because of limited space and density, um, that's simply not possible anymore. So the focus has really shifted from construction and implementation to thinking about how we can empty and safely transport and treat the excreta or fecal sludge from, from pits. This is what, you know, would be on the cover of a book for fecal sludge. And, you know, it's, um, you know, you don't want to pick it up, but it's, it's a well-managed, fairly clean, uh, easy to handle resource that that looks quite nice. It might make you think of compost or even cattle manure. You know, it doesn't have um, it doesn't give you a, a terrible visceral reaction. But this, unfortunately, is not the reality. This is what we're aiming for: to have these beautiful drying beds where the sludge is poured on in these nice even layers, and they dry and they crack we can harvest it. Um, there's been a lot of innovation lately um, thinking about resource recovery for fecal sludge. So we, we realized, okay, we need to start emptying pit latrines. We need to start managing this fecal sludge. Um, one option that's becoming quite popular is producing briquettes. Uh, this is a photo from uh, an a nonprofit in, in Kenya called uh, Sanivation. So trying to repurpose, add value, create incentives, business models, all that good stuff. Um, again, co-compost. Um, co-compost is, is just sort of a fancy word for composting or traditional organic materials like market waste, grass clippings, etc., with fecal sludge. So um, basically just combining the two feedstocks. You know, this looks beautiful. You would think, okay, I'm gonna buy some of this compost, this beautiful repurposed compost for my garden. Um, testing the temperature here, making it sure it's thermophilic. Um, again, this is from a cover of a report or manual. And I couldn't get this red circle off, but there are many uses for fecal sludge. And I would say in the last five to 10 years, this, this discipline has really exploded. Um, thinking about all the potential energy opportunities, uh, everything from biogas to the briquettes, looking again at the nutrients, um, not only within the fecal sludge um, and using it like in coke compost or as a soil amendment, but also using it to potentially grow um, things like animal fodder. So in areas where um, maybe it's difficult to raise um, animal herds, you know, you can grow hay with the fecal sludge. Um, black soldier flies, 
I won't get into that. You know, there's there's many different ways to use it. Obviously, the water component is quite valuable in some situations, and and people are even investigating um, building material. So this is the dream, right? This is what we're all aiming for. What everyone talks about. Let's get the nutrients. Let's get the water. Let's get the energy. Let's get everyone sanitation, right? Like it just, it sounds so good. And yet it's not that easy, right? So the first challenge of recovering some sort of value from fecal sludge is really getting the shit out of the pit, right? Like just actually moving fecal sludge and emptying it from a pit is very, very difficult. Um, so here you can see these two presumably very strong men uh, really straining to pump fecal sludge out of a pit using what's called a gulper. Um, this is quite a low cost technology. Um, people build them here in Malawi. You, you suck it up, you push down, the sludge shoots into the container. Um, but you know, that's a 50 liter container that's gonna weigh at least 50 kilograms. You gotta move each one, right? So thinking about filling up those nice drying beds container by container, uh, you start to realize how far away that, that reality might be. And actually transporting it, especially in informal settlements is extremely difficult. Um, obviously transport is a huge issue. Um, this is a rocky street, it's not ideal, but at least it's fairly wide. If you've ever been in um, some, some informal settlements, you find the roads are just so, so, so narrow. Um, it would be almost impossible to get, you know, something even as simple as this small cart um, between some of the houses, let alone uh, a motorized vehicle. Uh, this is a photo from Blantyre um, that's operated by the local Pit Emptiers Association. They use 200 liter drums to collect and transport the sludge um, and have, have a vehicle that they share. But again, this is just not realistic for servicing, for servicing many of the areas that actually require it. So it's kind of a paradox. The areas that need the fecal sludge emptying um, have really sort of serious access barriers, and yet that, that's where they need to go. So sort of getting to the crux of my, my argument and my talk is, is the further reality of actually trying to empty pits. And you see on the right, a pit emptier. Um, I can't tell who he is here, but this is from Blantyre. Um, just the amount of trash that goes into pits is, is actually quite incredible. And so not only is this terrible work, it's very difficult work. Um, he's using a metal rod to fish out the trash. Um, you know, where that trash goes and how that trash is disposed after becomes a very, very difficult question to answer. Usually what they will do is dump it back into the pit. Um, and in doing so, really reducing the life expectancy of that pit, right? So they'll take out the trash, suck out the fecal sludge, put the trash back in, but then you know, that's just going to continually pile up until eventually the pit will probably just be filled with trash. Um, on the left hand side, this is one of the, the, the motorized trucks, a vacuum truck. And because they have quite a strong vacuum, they're able to suck out the sludge with quite a bit of the trash in it. So when they discharge it, you're getting a mix again of trash and fecal sludge. So really, really far away from that nice photo I showed you earlier, 
of, of those nice fecal sludge drying beds that were just perfectly dry and, and, and usable. Here we start to see the trash at the household, the trash at the disposal point, and obviously that trash is going to affect um, any potential treatment or resource recovery options. Oops, what's happening here? Hello. There we go. This is just a close up. You can see the hook on the end of his pole there. And basically he just uses that to, to fish out the trash. And you can see a condom there um, that, that's been pulled out. You'll find a lot of menstrual hygiene waste, but everything um, up to and including old shoes, jeans, who knows what, alcohol, anything that you want to hide that you are either embarrassed of or uh, don't know where to put usually goes in the pit latrine and and obviously has serious repercussions for for your sanitation technology over the long term in blantyre we have um, very very limited solid waste collection it's not unique um, many cities i would say almost every city has has um, low levels of sanit of trash collection um, here you just see i like this picture just because it's so much recyclable material um, that we think of as sort of having a value this has been collected from probably a high income area so where i live um, i live in kind of a fancier suburb um, and I do have trash collection once a week but the trash services um, are really only for maybe 10% of the population so the majority of people and certainly everyone who's living in an informal area would not have trash collection so the options then for trash disposal become pit latrine or or oops that's the wrong title or burning and actually this is a photo from the hospital um, it makes me sad every time I see it but this is how the hospital the biggest hospital in Malawi uh, disposes of their medical waste so this is everything from expired medication uh, rubber gloves um, catheters syringes I've seen body parts, um, everything. We don't need to get into detail, but literally everything gets burned. And on the days that the trash gets burned, the whole hospital and, and sort of the whole street up to the hospital is just covered in a really thick, toxic, disgusting smell. So, you know, as someone who doesn't have trash collection, it's, it's not a very easy decision. Do you burn your trash and stand there in the toxic smoke or do you throw it in your pit latrine and, and just hope that it won't fill up too fast, right? It's, it's a zero sum game. There's no, there's no easy answer. But I also wanted to point out that, you know, this isn't exclusively a problem of, of low income countries. Um, I took this from somewhere, anyways, March, when Corona started. And, you know, across the world, in Canada and the UK, everyone got really crazy about hygienizing things and wiping things down and buying Clorox wipes and stuff. And, oh gosh, my battery's gonna die. Um, and um, the wastewater treatment plants were overwhelmed. Right? There was so much more trash getting flushed. And I think, you know, our generation, okay, you're younger than me, my generation and your generation, we were quite sensitized, I think, not to put things like Q-tips or condoms or, or menstrual waste in the toilet. And yet this really just caused people to panic and thought, okay, it might have viruses on it. Let me throw it 
in the trap in the in the in the toilet. And similarly with masks, um, we've seen these are photos from I think Hong Kong, and and we've just seen such an increase in in solid waste um, just from this single event. And I think it's kind of brought home to people in rich Western countries that that our our infrastructure is is not um, indestructible and that solid waste is starting to affect not only our natural environment but our built environment and and I'm I was actually sort of not happy but it did start to raise the awareness I think of a lot of people about the the potential impacts of solid waste on our water wastewater uh, and natural environment systems so my computer's gonna die in a minute and I'm gonna run get my charger, but despite all of the potential for nutrient recovery, for energy, for water, for nutrients, I think we must still focus on sanitation, excuse me, as being a human right. Um, that should be the first and most important objective. There's lots of nice benefits that we can have from nutrient recovery, but right now, despite many startups and a lot of hype and Gates Foundation throwing money at all these different uh, social impacts, investments, no one can make money off of sanitation yet. And I really do think it's important that we think of sanitation as something like education, as healthcare, you know, it's an investment that the government has to provide in order to ensure the health of its people. It's not something that that we should privatize or or try to um, make into something that we can make profitable. If it's not profitable, it must still exist. Um, trash is not only a problem in the global south; it's a global problem, and I would argue that it's becoming um, a problem even more quickly in rich countries. Um, we can think about and discuss the impacts of trash in low income countries, but certainly must think about the impacts on our own infrastructure. And, and really, I mean, we just, we cannot think about sustainable sanitation without um, considering trash. So I'm gonna run get my charger, one second. Um, 